It all starts with a question. What makes a special collection so special in the first place? My name's Peter, and this is Stacks and Facts. So this introduction looks a little different because I'm recording on my phone. I'm moving and I already packed my camera because uh, that's how I do. Um, but I wanted to make sure that I got this recorded so I could get this video out as soon as possible. So last weekend I was in Toronto uh, for a conference called OpenCon and we'll talk about that in a future video. But since I was in Toronto, I wanted to swing by the local library. Uh, it just so happens that Toronto Public Library has a bunch of special collections and one of them is, oh, the greatest. It is the Merrill collection of science fiction, speculative fiction, and fantasy. And I was so fortunate that when I emailed them to ask if I could come and check it out and make a video about it, uh, the director, Sefra Hussein, was very excited to have me. So I sat down with Sefra, as well as Kim Hull, who's one of the librarians there, and we talked about the collection and its history. Uh, and that's all I'm gonna say. I just wanna cut straight to it. But uh, yeah, it was a blast. Uh, so Toronto Public Library is it was so great to be down there. I'm so excited that I get to share this with you because uh, they gave up a lot of time to let me just show up and ask them whatever I wanted and then they showed me some great materials. So I'm super excited to share those materials with you. So excited, in fact, that I'm making two videos. This first video is gonna be the, in the interview between myself and Sephra and Kim. And then the second video uh, is going to be basically a walkthrough of a bunch of the things that Kim showed me. Uh, I got it for stock footage and she is such a wealth of information that I think it deserves a video of its own. So uh, without further ado, let's get into it. My name is Sefer Hussein, and I'm the Senior Department Head of the Merrill Collection, Science Fiction, Speculation and Fantasy, and also the Senior Department Head of the Osborne Collection of Early Children's Books. I'm Kim Hull, and I'm a general librarian at uh, the Merrill Collection. I do reference questions, and I am also a cataloger. You know, I think when people think, especially of public libraries, they think of circulation. These days, they probably think about programs. But in general, the materials that they're probably envisioning are more ephemeral in nature. So items that are probably going to be weeded out after a time, things that get heavily used, by many people and special collections allows a way to keep these items in perpetuity to reduce the handling on them but the, to also make them available to the public. Science fiction on the other hand um, being I guess quote unquote newer genre if you want to compare it to things like the Baldwin collection over at Toronto Reference or the Arthur Conan Doyle collection that sort of thing the materials might be a little more contemporary but one day they will also be part of these ancient tomes you know and um, it's also one of those those genres that get probably not as much love as, as it should, or as much respect as it should. Um, I think a lot of people don't see them in the same, don't see the literature the same way that they see other types of literature, don't have the same kind of respect for the writing. But I mean, the, the quality and, and breadth of topics is um, every bit as important and wonderful. And uh, so it's important for, a library like Toronto Public Library, which is the largest circulating library in the entire world, to have such a collection because we are also in the best place to advocate for it. And we're always looking for more opportunities to do that for the genre, but also for, you know, rare books and special materials in general. It is different than the than the circulating collections. They tend to be more popular culture. And uh, what's the, the flavor of the month? We have things going back to, I think the oldest thing we have is about 1750. And a variety of media. We have pulp magazines from the early part of the 20th century. We have different versions of things that are available to the general public and researchers as well that you're not going to find any place else. And we're always having people coming in and saying, I read such and such a book and I'm trying to identify it. I've done it myself. And we can maybe reconnect them with this treasure that they had from their childhood that they're not going to be able to find any place else. As I say, just the breadth and the depth that the, that the circulating collections cannot offer. Many, many, many years after, you know, maybe the circulating copy has ceased to exist, we will still have hopefully a good, you know, a copy in good condition that people can look at thereafter. And it's, it's sort of a, a way to keep our history, obviously. For sure. For sure. I don't think a lot of people know like what the lifespan of a book that circulates is. Um, I was wondering, for example, like a mass market, do you have any idea of like how long you can keep a copy before it has to get replaced? 
It's, it's hard to pinpoint it, but of course it depends on the quality of the, the item itself. You know, if it's a really poorly made mass market paperback, then it's probably going to fall apart before long. Also depends how many people use it, how many times you have to ship it across the city. But in general, I would say, you know, the lifespan of just your average mass market paperback is probably about five years if I had to guess, mm -hmm. just because of use and handling. And a lot of the items that the Merrill Collection has is longer than five years, right? Oh, definitely. We have uh, we have items that are much older. <laughs> and I'd like to say, even if something is completely falling apart, if it's important to the genre, we're keeping it. And we're going, we actually actively try to conserve these materials as well. We do have a preservation and digitization department and a conservation lab that help us to take these kinds of actions. <laughs> Can you tell me how and why did it start? So essentially, uh, Judith Merrill was a prominent science fiction author and editor, and she donated her personal collection to Toronto Public Library. It was about 5,000 items to begin, and it was initially housed at the Palmerston branch for the first few years. Then it moved to 40 St. George, and um, the collection grew to such a size that uh, it was no longer a suitable home for it. And so the initial donation happened in 1970. Um, and then by, so fast forward to 1995, uh, they renamed what was first known as the Spaced Out Library, became the Merrill Collection of Science Fiction, Speculation and Fantasy. And it's now currently housed at 239 College Street in the Lillian H. Smith branch and has been here ever since. And the collection has grown substantially to well over 80,000 items and growing all the time. The building was built to house the two special collections for light humidity temperature control, once again, to conserve the items, looking at them as, as artifact. Do you want to hear about the ashes that are in the foundations? Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, yesterday was Halloween. So That's true, it's true. I won't name names, um, just that someone who was a prominent author in Toronto, their, uh, their spouse died, and the spouse had requested their ashes to be scattered either in the foundations of the Opera House or the new Toronto Public Library, which was this building. So the night before they poured the foundations, they apparently broke in through the hoardings and poured his ashes, and then the next day the, uh, um, the foundations were poured for this building. So he did get his wish, awesome. and uh, we don't know if it's haunted or not, but if it is, it's a benevolent spirit. And this seems like the appropriate branch to be yes, haunted, yes, right? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Cool. I think the large collection of role-playing game manuals is always a surprise to people. We're purported to have the world's largest collection available in a public library setting, so that's pretty great. But we really do have... Um, you would probably know the numbers better, Kim, or have a well, sense of got, them better. But yeah, we've got about 2,000 um, role-playing games and about 5,000 uh, graphic novels. Uh, so that's a very large collection as well. I don't know how it stacks up against some of the other the other libraries. And uh, what else do we have? The large collection of pulp magazines. We do have a small collection of uh, science fiction art. We've brought out a couple of things for you to have a look at, which is not actually part of our mandate. We just things started sticking to us at a certain point. I think people were donating things and uh, we do occasionally acquire something, but there's no real formal acquisition policy, but there's some interesting little gems in there. Part of our mandate is to try and collect one of everything in the English language written in this genre, or these genres rather. So being situated in North America might be somewhat to our advantage, you know, with the English publishing world, I guess, and with maybe a lot of the content at least in popular culture, sort of skewing towards the United States. We certainly don't discriminate when we select materials, but just in terms of the, the amount of material available, you'll probably find that more is available from the United States than perhaps anywhere else in, in these genres, at the moment anyway. Yeah, for sure. You said one of everything. Yes. We're running out of room. Yeah. <laughs> We're working on it. <laughs> Space is always an issue, but, um, you know, that, that is part of our mandate, and there's a lot of great publishing happening in, in this area, thankfully, so, you know, we're just going <laughs> to keep buying whatever our sort of yearly stipend allows us to, and we'll see how it goes. <laughs> All right, y'all, so was that not the coolest thing? I was so excited to scope it out, uh, the, the collection, and I was so, I felt so privileged that they actually brought me into the archives itself and showed me a bunch of really cool things. So if you actually want to see the stories behind all of those objects that I showed as stock footage, uh, go ahead and check out 
that video, uh, there should be a little thing that popped out. Otherwise, there's a link in the description where it's just Kim walking me through all of those really cool books and other items that we were just looking at. So if you like this video, maybe consider subscribing. There's a button down there. Uh, I make videos about twice a month uh, talking about libraries and information science in a way that I hope is accessible to everyone. Um, and uh, yeah, that's about it. Maybe share this video with someone in your life that you think likes science fiction. So that's it. Uh, until next time, thank you for watching, and don't forget to ask questions. All right, bye.